so yeah, local talent. Um, and thank you all for um, your attention and participation in I, what I think is a really amazing opportunity to reach out about what we're doing here at the NCI. Um, I most recently took over as the director of the Comparative Oncology Program here, which has been in existence for now almost 11 years. And so what I'll be um, going over today with you all is um, a new initiative that we're hoping to launch this year. Um, it's a nice partnership with um, Dr. Gilbert, who recently joined us as chief of the neuro-oncology branch. And um, we are going to uh, delve more deeply into brain tumors as a um, relevant animal model of human disease. And so this sort of ties nicely into a lot of topics that have already been raised um, this morning. So we'll be able to circle back again to um, Carolyn's um, entree into comparative oncology, but then also raise opportunities for um, other um, avenues that we can potentially add into our collaboration. So uh, some of this you've already heard, but again, just to reiterate, what is comparative oncology? Well, it, basically we um, leverage naturally occurring cancers in companion animals, particularly dogs, but also consider cats. Um, basically at this point, we know that veterinary clinician scientists are able to provide more than just specialized care for pet dogs and cats that have cancer. They really play a, a really pivotal role in training and, and adding research expertise to multidisciplinary endeavors. Um, these veterinarians are residency trained and board certified and have access to a pretty amazing complement of basic science um, as a result of their training. And the American College of Veterinary Internal Medicine is our um, governing body um, that helps us really um, maintain a high level of training and expertise in our, um, in our college and in our, in our discipline. And I would say that the discipline is very flourish is flourishing at this point. There are um, more and more peer-reviewed publications in high-impact journals, uh, lots of training programs that, again, combine um, both the residency um, training with PhD and master's programs. Um, and many of our um, residency training sites have access to and, and strong collaborations with medical centers. And this has all also led to a greater access of clinical trials um, for pet owners in the public that are seeking um, that level of care and are interested in participating in these, in these kinds of efforts. So why do we need it? Well, you know, comparative oncology um, really, I think, drives home the point that cancer is an extremely complex disease. And I don't need to tell this audience, um, really, that's master of the obvious statement. But I think as we've learned a little bit about today, thinking about the drug development path currently as it stands has an unacceptably high rate of attrition, um, an unsustainable cost structure, and we, I think, all agree that no one animal model can fully complement the in silico knowledge that we have and that grows every day. And we know that companion animals with cancer have and can, moving forward, in, inform human cancer research, um, and that has a bi-directional benefit to both species. So we know that our program and the efforts that have um, grown at our um, network of institutions has grown, um, and all of that together, I think, drives home the point that we have to invest more fully into training the next generation of veterinary scientists that will help um, move this field forward. Um, so I have a screen capture of the CCR, um, the Center for Cancer Research, which is the intramural um, branch of the NCI. Our program sits there under the office of the director, and you're welcome to visit this website, although it's being updated and um, made much more um, informative and useful. So um, feel free to take a look in your spare time. So this figure has been used quite a bit over the last few years. And um, basically, it, it again, just reiterates where we feel that the tumor-bearing dog, the companion dog that has naturally occurring cancer, can really inform the drug development path as um, agents move from the standard sort of preclinical models. Um, again, a nod to the comments earlier about GLP and GCP compliant talks and clinical trials um, in people, you know, we, we have an opportunity to inform, I think, very early on in that, in that path to help um, where points of decision making should be considered prior to really expensive and involved clinical trials um, that would definitely benefit from having additional sort of deep questions being asked about that agent. So I've talked to a lot of people in the field as I've taken on this role and um, one, one nameless individual said to me once, you know, if drug companies want to study a drug and understand whether it works in people, they should just put it in people and see if it works. But if you really want to ask questions about 
um, deep relationships between um, target modulation and PKPD relationships and how the um, refinement of dose and schedule should be evaluated prior to doing expensive and involved human clinical trials, that's where we need to focus our efforts. And so I think we just kind of, again, feeding back into the communication challenges we all face, not only do we still have a lot to do with the, yes, dogs get cancer conversation, but that we have a lot to offer um, the cancer drug development pathway with what we can um, observe and study in our companion dog species of naturally occurring cancer. So I, I put this up here just to drive home that, again, cancer being such a complex disease, we have lots of opportunities to um, evaluate uh, the hallmarks of cancer that have been so beautifully outlined by Hanahan and Weinberg. Um, this is the second sort of generation of, of the hallmarks of cancer paper that first came out in 2001. Um, you know, I think that there are many opportunities to, uh, for us to tell stories about how dogs could potentially and have already contributed to um, drug um, development opportunities for all these different pathways that we know to be important um, in developing anti-cancer drugs. Um, one point that's worth driving home in that I think as we approach canine um, cancer specifically and we start asking questions about how comparable are they to human cancers, um, we need to consider both what they have in common but that also what makes them unique. And so in the case of melanoma, you know, these diseases exhibit really key differences in activating mutations, but they do demonstrate very similar malignant potential and biologic behavior in vivo. Um, and so I, I think what we need to do sort of in the spirit of Venn diagrams, which seem to be a pretty common theme today, we, we really need to believe that um, more work needs to be done to sort of populate these types of diagrams to understand where dogs have commonality and translational relevance to people and also what about them might be very unique and then provide follow-on opportunities for further study. Um, and so one other example of that is a, a nice uh, example of where cross-species genomics really uncovered targets that could be linked to um, a disease that's very relevant to pediatric patients and dogs, osteosarcoma, uh, wherein um, a, a nice, nicely populated study of both tumor and normal tissues um, uncovered new targets that could be then back translated to human studies and then again, further, you know, strengthen the model of the dog as a naturally occurring um, osteosarcoma model. You've seen this slide already as well. We've already um, contacted the, uh, <laughs> the office within the, um, the NIH to get Alabama changed to Arkansas, so thank you. <laughs> thank you for that. <laughs> it's been a really informative uh, morning so far uh, for pointing out our mistakes. And this slide is not new, so this has been used for a decade probably, which is kind of embarrassing, actually. Um, and yeah, we need to be more, um, I think, reaching out to Canada to give them an actual landmass to sit on. <laughs> so that's embarrassing as well. Um, flush. But yeah, so I, for those of you who aren't familiar, I mean, the Comparative Oncology Trials Consortium really seeks to... Um, in a politically neutral way, and so then, you know, I cringe when I hear the left out um, cooperative oncology group. Um, you know, I, I think we need to sort of look forward to being more politically neutral and welcoming to everybody who is in this consortium as far as um, providing equal opportunity to those who really want to participate in these types of trials. Certainly there are institutions who are going to be more able to or willing to or, you know, based on their caseload, participate in certain studies. Um, but you know, the, the take home message here is that we have a group of really talented people that have deep expertise, infrastructure, and scholarly interest in participating in the types of studies that are designed to actually deliver data to the human drug development side that is actually waiting for this kind of data to help move them, them their pathway forward. Um, so we will fix the slide and then send it out to everybody <laughs> so they can use it in their own talk with the correct state labels. Um, also just to sort of give you an idea of how we function. So our group, um, basically we function as um, uh, value adding from a scientific standpoint when we work with a study sponsor that may have a drug or um, a group of candidate drugs 
that they're interested in um, studying in tumor-bearing dogs to help, again, ask and answer very specific questions about that drug before it moves forward. We provide um, protocol and scientific input on study design. We assist um, with data management and um, drug and trial package management, coordination of protocol, adverse events, data safety monitoring boards, and all of the sort of day-to-day -day functions for trials that are really difficult for certain sponsors to maintain in-house. Um, we don't handle any of the finances. We simply um, link the sponsor with the sites and then the money flows directly from them to the sites that are participating for support of the um, investigators, the technical support, and the clinical case management for the dogs that are um, participating in the trial. And then each individual site maintains its own iCook um, and other internal sort of regulatory approval documents. And if anyone's interested in hearing more about this, I can um, tell you more at the break if you'd like. But this is basically how we function. And really at this point, I mean, we've had comparative oncology here at the NCI for a decade now. And so I think, again, our challenge moving forward is to um, take what we used to consider as old questions. So again, you know, will, if we give drug X to dogs with cancer, will the tumor get smaller? Will that drug make this dog sick? Um, do dogs get the same kinds of cancers as people? Um, those sort of basic questions, I think we now see a future in our program to really challenge those types of questions to become more complex, more in-depth, and more relevant to high-end drug, drug discovery and drug development. So we need to be asking questions about why. So if drug X is succeeding or failing in humans, can the dog actually inform on the why, the mechanistic uh, background behind that? Um, as Carolyn mentioned earlier, can we evaluate drugs in the context of minimal residual disease? Because we have access to animals that develop cancer in a sort of longitudinally relevant way. So there are several months that go by between resection of a primary tumor and development of metastatic disease, which is certainly an, you know, not a common theme in rodent models. Can we then leverage that opportunity to evaluate drugs that might target the, the biology of metastasis in a very specific way? Um, can we ask questions about actionable targets rather than just shared histology between humans and dogs? So I think that's really where we need to be thinking moving forward. So right now, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Gilbert to tell you more about brain tumors, and then we'll circle back and sort of um, go through what we hope to be a flourishing new collaboration here at the NCI. Great. Thank you so much, Amy, and uh, it's really a great honor to be here, and um, I have to say by way of disclosure that uh, I've been at the NIH now four months, one week, and two days, but who's counting? Um, but my second week on the, on the job, um, Amy made an appointment to come visit with me to talk about her vision for comparative oncology, for collaborating, um, and to create um, a, a canine glioma network that we would work and, and really create the bridge between um, uh, humans and, and, and the canines. Um, one of my colleagues immediately said, so brain tumors have gone to the dogs, and I guess that's true. Um, but I, I want to frame it, kind of what, what the challenge is. I've been doing this now for 30 years, and um, unfortunately, I can't report on a whole lot of progress, but I, I see these types of collaborations as, as a method of really accelerating our progress. How big of a problem? About 45,000 people a year are diagnosed with a primary brain tumor in the United States. About half of them are malignant. Represents less than 2% of cancer. Um, but as an, a, a neuro-oncologist, I will tell you the impact on patient families is absolutely devastating. So it is a terrible disease to which we don't have a very good solution. Um, briefly reviewing um, malignant glioma. We look at malignant glioma um, really in two flavors, something we call a primary glioblastoma that means that we think it ar ar arose de novo, and then the secondary glioblastoma starting off as a lower grade neoplasm, uh, and then evolving or undergoing malignant transformation uh, to a higher grade malignancy. And there's some characteristic molecular findings. For example, in the secondary glioblastoma, a lot of these tumors have p53 mutation, um, abnormalities in the platelet-derived growth factor pathway, whereas in the primary, we see a lot of issues with the epidermal growth factor receptor pathway, 
as well as uh, P10 mutation. A lot of overlap, but that's a, a, a pretty uh, good approximation. However, in 2009, there was a publication in a uh, fairly well-known journal, New England Journal of Medicine, uh, the IDH mutation isocitrate dehydrogenase almost exclusively in the secondary uh, glioma. And this becomes a very important point as we move forward uh, because they're clearly different diseases based on IDH mutational status. A lot of work done in glioblastoma. The initial disease targeted by the Cancer Genome Atlas program funded by the NCI was glioblastoma. Um, several years, over $100 million of funding essentially led to this. And what it shows us is that it's an incredibly complicated disease. They were able to categorize the molecular abnormalities into three broad categories. You see the RTK, RAS, B3 kinase pathway, P53, um, and the RB uh, pathway. What you notice, even without using a calculator, if you look at the incidence of these abnormalities, it adds up to over 100. In fact, it's 200%, so there's overlap. Making it more complicated, even within a pathway, you have abnormalities that are both upstream and downstream, and they can be in the same tumor. So it's a very heterogeneous, very complicated disease to which we have not figured out the answer. TCGA, a lot of work done on this enormous and wonderful data set, and we now think that there are four subtypes of glioblastoma you see here, given the titles proneural, neural, classical, mesenchymal, and this has also been helpful in allowing us to talk about enrichment of populations in the context of clinical trial. What are the current standards of care? Well, surgery um, has been shown to be beneficial. Uh, we know that from some uh, studies done, both uh, retrospective review as well as prospective analysis, the more complete the resection in glioma, the better the outcome. Um, and this has been very helpful as we've moved forward, but the changes, the improvements have been measured really in, in just a month or two. Radiation was actually, is now a standard, of course. It's the cornerstone of treatment, but it did take a series of randomized trials to prove that radiation doubled survival from three to four months to eight to nine months. So we are talking about a highly malignant, highly deadly disease. And for the longest time, actually for the first half of my career, we had no evidence that chemotherapy helped for the most malignant brain tumor glioblastoma. It wasn't until 2005 with this publication in the New England Journal of Medicine that proved that the oral chemotherapy agent temozolomide actually improved survival. If you look at the survival curve here, you can see that there is a tail. So the two-year survival rate went from 10% to 26%. It was statistically significant, it's become the standard of care, but it's certainly not the final answer. So why are we having so much difficulty? Well, these tumors are inherently resistant, but we also have the issue of the blood-brain barrier. So a lot of the portfolio that my medical oncology colleagues use to treat brain tumors don't get into the brain. So we have this additional challenge. Um, and again, the biggest issue, of course, is it is a highly resistant neoplasm. So we have looked at alternatives, and one of the areas I wanted to focus on today was angiogenesis inhibition. As it turns out, glioblastoma is amongst the most angiogenic of all cancers, and in fact, a lot of the seminal work done in angiogenesis by an investigator, Judah Folkman, in Boston was based in brain tumor models. So for those of you who don't spend a lot of time looking at brain MRI, this is post-contrast. And the contrast enhancement we see here is because of leaky blood vessels. Here we show an evidence histologically of vascular proliferation, one of the hallmarks of glioblastoma. Here's in situ hybridization looking at vascular endothelial growth factor production. And my favorite is an old angiogram. So back when I was in training, it's a long time ago, we didn't have CT and MR. We used to do angiograms to have the surgeon find the vascular blush. Don't see many of those at all. So it turns out VEGF, vascular endothelial growth factor A, is the main factor produced by glioblastoma, cr creates tremendous angiogenesis, and it turns out we have an, an agent, bevacizumab, that is a monoclonal antibody against VEGF A. And so this seemed to be a very logical thing. Use bevacizumab in brain tumors, and here we are, we have our eureka moment. 
in deference to Dr. Goldberg, who spent a lot of time um, with his animation. I don't want to tell you how long it took me to animate this, but <laughs> it's not animated yet. Everybody's got to pay attention because it only lasts a second. So here we have the intravascular space where we have floating factors. Um, and so here's our VEGFA. And because it's an antibody, we don't think it does a good job crossing the blood-brain barrier. So how could it work? Well, it works by sequestering the VEGF. All right, sorry. <laughs> so it was logical to test it. And there were a series of clinical trials. Probably the most germane was one that was uh, uh, published back in 2009 uh, that actually led and I'll show you into the approval for bevacizumab for recurrent glioblastoma. Simple randomized trial bevacizumab or bevacizumab with a chemotherapy arena TCAN, which was a standard therapy for colon cancer, which was the first approval of bevacizumab. Looking at the data, looking at the images, it looked pretty good. You look at the response rate, um, you look at the response rate in the 30 to 40 percent, you look at the progression-free survival, um, and actually, I don't have the data here in the interest of time, but steroid requirement went down, patient's quality of life improved because you were seeing tumor shrinkage on the order of what's presented here. And so it seemed pretty logical if it worked in recurrent or regrowing glioblastoma, let's bring it up front. And that's what we did. And I was fortunate enough to lead this trial that was published last year in the New England Journal of Medicine. Um, and this was a large cooperative group study, so it was actually three of the cancer cooperative groups, the radiation therapy group, North Central group, and the Eastern cooperative group. And we asked the question, if you add bevacizumab, an anti-angiogenic agent, to the standard therapy of radiation temozolomide for patients with newly diagnosed glioblastoma, do you improve survival? Do you improve progression-free survival? We included in this some patient outcomes measures, quality of life, symptom burden, and neurocognitive function. And we also demanded tumor tissue so we can do some molecular analysis. And here's the schema. You can see patients started about halfway through their radiation were randomized to either placebo or bevacizumab as it was a double-blinded trial. And then they continued on as a standard with 12 months of temozolomide with either placebo or bevacizumab. We had to, at the time of progression, allow the patients to cross over um, because the, the bevacizumab is an approved therapy. It was a remarkable journey. I'm very happy to say that my colleagues really participated. Even though it was a double-blind placebo-controlled trial, we accrued 40 patients a month and received tumor tissue on 100% of the patients. So it was a, a really remarkable uh, event. Unfortunately, when we looked at the data, we did not see any improvement in overall survival, despite what looked like tremendous um, data from a, from a recurrent study. We saw an improvement in progression-free survival, but for reasons I won't go into, it did not reach statistical significance based on our statistical plan. So we didn't see any of the pre-specified endpoints. So at the end of the day, we had to conclude that it didn't improve overall survival in patients with glioblastoma. We did see improvement in progression-free survival, but it didn't reach the specified target. And more importantly, when we looked at the neurocognitive function and symptom burden, patients on the bevacizumab actually were getting worse. So not only was the progression-free survival just a little longer, but it may not have been progression-free survival. It may have been a masking of tumor um, by the bevacizumab. And we did some molecular profiling studies, and I think those may be informative. But overall, we had to conclude that we didn't see a benefit. We proved that we can do a multifaceted clinical trial, but the reason I present this is we don't have a good model of angiogenesis in our preclinical models. The mouse, the rat models do not help us. So what I immediately thought of is if we could have done parallel and companion studies in a canine glioma network, would we have predicted this outcome before we embarked on a study that enrolled almost 1,000 patients and took four years of effort? So in that context, Amy and I have been talking about how one goes about creating a, a network, a collaborative network, 
And I mentioned to her in our first meeting about CERN. This is not the nuclear collider um, in Switzerland, although if you do Google CERN, that's where you'll go. Um, if you Google CERN ependymoma, then you get us. So this is the Collaborative Ependymoma Research Network, and it's really a model of cross-discipline team science. And for those of you who don't know, ependymoma is a primary tumor. It arises, we think, from the ependymal cells that line the lateral ventricles the, and the spinal canal, and so you can get supratentorial, infratentorial, um, and spinal cord ependymoma. Classification, it's pretty simple. It's grade one, two, or three by WHO. Um, and there's been very little work, as evidenced here, on the 10-year reference number, look at glioma, almost 5,000, glioblastoma, 3,000, and ependymoma, 425. Um, a lot of work going into pediatrics, because it's about 10 or 12% of pediatric brain tumors, um, but it's 250 adults a year who get this, so it's been very difficult. So I was very fortunate. Um, I had a patient with ependymoma uh, whose family was interested in advancing the science. He was an adult, and they provided us philanthropy, and we created the Collaborative Ependymoma Research Network, and we're really going to bring it together. So we had clinical research, translation research, patient outcomes research, all working together, and we wound up expanding it internationally because it's such a rare disease so that we would have the critical mass of investigators to do the type of study. Here's a picture of the group. One of the nice things about having philanthropy is I think that this is on a beach in, in uh, Cancun. So that's no longer going to happen. I'm at the NIH. OK. <laughs> so as an overview of CERN, um, we, we really broke it down into five interacting projects. Um, schematically, number one is the clinical trials network. So everything really fed into finding new and better treatments for this disease. Project two was our pathology and molecular markers. We had project three, drug discovery, project four, basic science, and project five, patient outcomes. And we were able to create a, an adult and pediatric clinical trials network. And you can see the various centers that were involved. We've actually completed two clinical trials, um, both of which have presented, one of them just published. For project two, we were able to create a tissue repository, so rare disease, but you can see here, we have over 680 cases, clinically annotated tumor specimen on a rare disease. And this has allowed us great opportunity to do investigations which otherwise would have been impossible, and so it's led to a series of publications, and we continue to tap into this group of, of samples to do investigations as there are more discoveries. In project three, again, drug discovery, finding new agents. How do you target a rare disease? Well, the first thing you do is you look at the molecular biology that you know. You create an accurate mouse model. You then adapt that mouse model in vitro, uh, in vivo, uh, in vitro, I got it right, um, for screening. You do high, put, high throughput drug screening. You select those compounds that look interesting, and then you bring it back into the mouse model. And this was successfully done by colleagues within the CERN context. And you can see cancer cell article that outlines the entire process that was gone through to screen for ependymoma. And some candidates came out, which are now in clinical trial testing. How do you create the models? So in point of fact, when we developed CERN, I should have made project four, project three, but you know, who know? Um, so you take the molecular profiles, and there are various subtypes of ependymoma, you create that accurate mouse model, and then you start looking in the context of these models for oncogenes and also tumor suppressor genes, and then you, again, investigate. You come up with models for each of the subtype of ependymoma. And of course, um, these types of work, very highly touted, published in Nature. And then more recently, actually, Coincidentally, on the same day that my New England Journal of Medicine paper was published, my collaborators in CERN published in Nature finding a unique fusion, um, which we call Relay fusion, um, in supratentorial ependymoma that gives it a unique phenotype. Um, and the, the, this fusion results in constitutive activation of the NF-kappa B, a potential therapeutic target. 
And again, the final component of CERN, which I find most compelling, was our interest in the patient experience. And so one of my colleagues sent out a survey. We have over 300 patients who have responded to the survey. And what we found out is that in many of the patients who are potentially cured or certainly have stable disease, a third of them have significant pain that affects their daily life. Three quarters of the patients who had spine disease are dealing with persistent weakness and nearly a third with brain tumors have cognitive issues preventing them from getting back to their normal life. We also found out that despite the fact that this is an incredibly rare disease, more than half the patients are being treated for by local community physicians, not at centers with expertise. And then finally, we were able to incorporate outcomes measures into our clinical trials and found that even in patients who Im by imaging had stable disease, we saw tremendous functional recovery, which we found to be incredibly gratifying. So a collective, multifaceted approach. Um, and I certainly want to, to thank the CERN team, and that's also the segue to ask Amy to come back up and, and finish. Thank you. Okay, thank you for that. So um, when we first met and, he, and uh, Mark told me all about CERN, I thought, so we could probably learn something from this and really use it to complement what we had already um, accomplished within comparative oncology. Um, to really, again, focus on asking new and more sophisticated questions of these dogs that develop cancer and live their lives with, with us as humans um, and really sort of take this, this sort of approach in comparative oncology into a, an area that previously we hadn't really been involved in, which was um, primary brain tumors in dogs. So here's the question, you know, why do we need yet another sort of um, comparative oncology-based um, consortium looking at brain tumors? Well, Brain cancer, as I think all of us would agree, is a devastating disease. Um, few, if any, effective therapies exist for dogs and humans. Um, we try to treat brain tumors in dogs. I think there are varying degrees of success. Um, for the glial cell tumors, I think it's more of a challenge than, com uh, than compared to meningiomas, which tend to be um, relatively um, straightforward most of the time from a surgical standpoint. But you know, I think past that, what we really need to be saying to ourselves is that we don't really know much about any of the molecular underpinnings of, of this disease. And at this point with comparative oncology, what we need to be doing is focusing on um, asking questions about consensus and comparative features, both within um, the molecular uh, landscape, but also looking at histopathological diagnosis and how those things compare and how uh, relatable are they to what is seen in people. Um, and also just acknowledging the shortcomings of rodent models, although they have tremendous value. When you think specifically about the brain, the fact that they're so small in physical size, um, there are limited access and opportunities for some of the more interventional um, biopsy-based um, and PKPD-driven um, techniques that are so valuable, I think, to um, really high-end drug discovery and um, other things like imaging techniques and radiotherapy protocol development, we really need to have access to a, a larger brain that can be studied over time. So without calling out anyone specific within the veterinary neuro-oncology uh, neuro community, it, this research is very alive and well. Um, <clears throat> there are people doing really amazing things with um, convection-enhanced delivery techniques, looking at targets for novel therapeutics, uh, really sophisticated brain tumor imaging and immunotherapies. Um, so this research is out there. And when I started to really educate myself, being a medical oncologist, not a, a neurologist or a neuro-oncologist by training, I really learned a tremendous amount of what is already happening in our community and started thinking about how we could bring these people together um, that I have a, a deep expertise in not only just brain tumor research and comparative brain tumor biology, but also had access to things like cell lines and reagents and um, imaging correlates, so cross-sectional um, imaging data sets that had a confirmatory diagnosis based on histology. Um, all of this clinical outcome data that comes from having a motivated pet owner who would seek treatment for their dog with a brain tumor. And so started to think about ways that we could bring this group together and really then went back to really 
contemplate my um, education about the CERN network and thinking about how it's a project-based approach and how our first step really would be to define the collaborators and establish a research environment that can support this kind of an endeavor. Um, and then when I, you know, sit and talk and think about this with other folks, you know, you realize that we have a lot of these things in place already. And so I just um, mentioned along with Carolyn about our clinical trial network, the COTC. So we have that in place. We need to rejuvenate and potentially rebrand it and really bring it up to um, to support this kind of a new um, effort, but also move all the trials that we have already in progress and are planning um, for non-brain tumor um, opportunities. We need to you know, work on, on supporting our network and making sure it's successful moving forward. Um, we have um, the CCOGC, which is the Comparative Oncology Genomics Consortium, which is a, an example of a multi-institutional biobanking effort. Um, that particular biobank contains um, histologies that are not brain tumor, but um, it provides an opportunity to then learn from the experience of SOP-driven, um, clinically annotated, high-quality um, biobanking that, again, depended very heavily um, on participating sites within our clinical trial network. Um, so we have that sort of lesson already learned. And then considering the other projects, you know, I think all of the pieces are, are there. We just need to bring it together. Um, and so what will the team look like? Well, obviously, we need to include expertise in neuro-oncology from both the veterinary and the um, MD side. Um, that same thing should be said about neuropathologists that are a very specific um, breed of folks that have deep expertise in these tumors, which can be extremely um, challenging to diagnose and classify. Um, we want to bring in experts in all of the major facets of this kind of an endeavor, so not just genomics and bioinformatics, but CNS pharmacology, molecular imaging, um, and then you know, the clinical trial design and execution, I think we have um, already a good network to sit at the center of these efforts moving forward. Um, and ob obviously our, my connection with Dr. Gilbert's group that, you know, we want to foster this within intramural NCI, but also reach out more fully to the academic sites that are doing amazing things. We just need to bring them into the group if they haven't already um, been introduced to what we do. So how do we add value? Um, I think that a, a, a project-based approach provides that framework to critically examine the gaps that we know to exist in the veterinary neuro-oncology side. Um, we want to be able to offer that opportunity to collaborate in a politically neutral fashion. Um, and I think, again, our, our first job is going to be to demonstrate that canine brain tumors have translational relevance because we just don't know enough about them. Um, they're relatively rare, and again, the independent research efforts at most institutions are relatively siloed, and so we need to help break down those barriers to help demonstrate a strong translational platform. And then we can take that data and, and that understanding and examine where the dog model can fill gaps that are known to exist in brain tumor research on the human side. Um, and again, just leveraging the opportunity to um, take the dog's physical size, their intact immunity, the comparative brain, uh, blood brain barrier structure and function, um, and the expertise that we know to exist already in the veterinary neuro oncology community to really um, move forward in a meaningful way. Um, again, a shameless plug for the Iowa meeting. So <laughs> you've seen that already, you'll see it again. So please come if you're able to. And um, we have a couple of slides of acknowledgments. So I'll leave this up here from from Mark's side and also from our um, standpoint at NCI, thanking a lot of people who have worked with us and their dedication to the effort is really amazing, so thank you. Right. Well, we have a few minutes for questions. Yeah. Who calls it out? Oh. <laughs> Be sure to use your mic. Okay. Uh, thank you. Technology. I'm technology challenged. And also, I'm Joe Cornegie, Texas A&M University. <laughs> maybe, that, maybe there's some linkage between the two. <laughs> so uh, in, in another reincarnation of myself, I, I uh, was, and I suppose still am, a veterinary neurologist, and was on faculty with one uh, Rod Page, who's seated to my left and chuckling at my jokes. Thank you, Rod. And uh, we were involved with two NCI program project grants dealing with spontaneous tumors uh, as models. 
Don Thrall in particular looking at hyperthermia as an agonist. And one of those uh, PPGs through NCI had a project on spontaneous brain tumors. And of course the interest was more so on the GVM side, but GVMs, as you know, just don't have the incidence on balance occurring spontaneously in dogs. They're there, they have in essence the same biological phenotype, but the incidence just wasn't or isn't that great to necessarily be able to truly fill out a preclinical trial. So the focus there was more so on the tumor-bearing brain using meningiomas and looking at the effects of hyperthermia. So all of that is to ask the question and to, to bleed back into the earlier presentation on the potential role of xenografts. So I think Peter Dickinson at UC Davis, to get to Dr. Laramore's uh, side of the operation, has uh, been using cell lines, canine cell lines, GBM cell lines, and then, if I'm correct, actually in turn using those back in mice and potentially could then, of course, I suppose, go back into brains uh, of dogs. But could you comment on two points? The ability to do preclinical trials in dogs given the relative rarity or infrequency of GBMs, high-grade gliomas, in dogs. And then secondly, the potential for xenografts, cell lines from canine GBMs and how those might apply. Sure. I, I think, so to your first point, you just gave me another reason to um, lobby quite s loudly for a multi-center effort. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, all 20 sites may not um, see 20 cases of brain tumor every month, but if we bind together and say, you know, we know that there are competing um, efforts at each institution that has a deep expertise in brain tumor research, because really of the 20 that we work with in the COTC network, um, about half of them have really deep expertise in veterinary neuro-oncology. And so, you know, Pete actually said to me, you know, I have my own trials. Why should I participate in yours? <laughs> um, but I, so I, I mean, and I understand that point. I think that the challenge then is that we will never get anywhere if we don't bound, bound together and um, get the, the caseload that we'll need to have these things move forward. But I think even Pat, before we even get into clinical trials and caseload and competing trials, I think that we still have a lot of work to do on <clears throat> understanding the basic biology of, the, of these tumors, because I think histology alone is not necessarily enough. I know it's not, because um, there's going to be a, a huge amount of work to really understand the genomic landscape of these diseases. We know that there are changes within canine glioma that more closely resemble pediatric glioma versus adult glioma. And so that's the challenge, is to really spend time very meaningfully evaluating the molecular underpinnings of the disease. Two more quick questions. So hi, Michael Sawgather, ex-NCI and now with Conifay Consulting Group. Are you uh, going to have a seat at the table for any um, groups with pediatric GBM? Because that's, if possible, even more dire than adult GBM, like the St. Jude's, et cetera, of the world, and reach out to them because as far as like human oncologists saying dogs get cancer, we find that especially so in the in the pediatric oncology community. So the answer is yes. So pediatric neuro-oncology is a, a critical part of the neuro-oncology branch and the brain tumor effort. And I think the CERN's a great model. One of the things I didn't emphasize was the fact it was a unique collaboration between pediatric neuro-oncologists and adult neuro-oncologists. So in, in ependymoma, the, the pediatric folks have the upper hand. It's a much more prevalent disease within the context of pediatric brain tumors, and they've been working on it far longer than us. So taking that model forward, the answer is absolutely. Ron Sokol from Colorado. Um, I was just wondering, is there a clinicaltrials.gov for animal trials? It looks like there's one vetcancer.trials. Mm -hmm. um, is that complete? And uh, is there a clinical trials uh, outside of cancer website? It's actually a very relevant point. There's um, a task force working within um, members of the sort of biomedical community from the veterinary side and the, with them partnering with the AVMA to sort of define the scope of how a multi-center sort of clinical trial clearinghouse website could be constructed, maintained, and um, deployed to allow just people to have greater access to um, what clinical trials are out there. There's a, an excellent model at Missouri, which is the clinical trials for ant, the vet, vet cancer trials 
um, website that's already up. And so I think you'll see and hear a lot more about that in the coming months. Thank you, Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.